Welcome to Birken Forest Monastery's live stream. Uh, I am Ajahn Sona, and let us proceed with the first question, Pia. Ajahn, our first question today is from the live stream from Jason in New Jersey. Dear Venerable, did the Buddha have anything to say about maintaining physical health? While I understand that detachment needs to be developed, a healthy body seems helpful for a sense of well-being. Well, he, yeah, he suggested that you behave sensibly in terms of taking care of your body, not overeating and not undereating. Uh, he did go through a period himself of more or less austerities, which uh, were injurious to the body. So he was uh, very deliberate in giving up those kind of spiritual practices that would injure your body. Uh, thinking that somehow that was beneficial, so he is teaching the middle path. Um, his suggestion for diet and exercise, he has some ideas for the monks and uh, moderation in food. Uh, he he does praise what is called kanji, which is a kind of porridge in the morning. Uh, he has a list of benefits of, of kanji uh, for the digestion and so forth. And he does praise walking as a form of staying in shape. It helps the body and helps digestion and helps the mind, uh, increases energy sometimes, etc. So uh, simple things. Um, humans are very good w at walking. Um, you see, of course, in the modern times, a lot of people running, uh, jogging, and so forth. This is kind of a modern... Uh, it seemed to have come in about in the 60s, the idea that adults run around on the sidewalks or on <laughs> jog and things like that. You never see that before. With <laughs> uh, But walking is, is very good. Um other exercises, uh, just moderate, uh, nothing uh, spectacular. Uh, there is no yoga exercises in, in uh, Theravada Buddhism. Uh, the yoga practices are not uh, part of the, the Buddhist teachings. And uh, yeah, moderation. And uh, uh, your mind is a, is a big player in your, your physical health as well. And if you in fact, it can be a major element in your physical health, of course. So the mind is the priority and the body is, is not to be neglected in terms of health. Yeah. Okay, next question. Our next question is from Michael in Melbourne, Australia. Dear Ajahn, I am in my mid-30s, happily married and in good health. However, I recently started to fixate on the fact that I will eventually die, and it puts me in a depressive state where anything that I do loses meaning. How can I reconcile and fully accept the idea of death and be at peace with it? I feel like this fear is holding me back in life, and I would like to be free of it. Is there any insight in the Buddhist philosophy? Well, it's a central issue in the Buddhist philosophy. Uh, the Buddha, in fact, encourages people to do the five subjects for frequent recollection <clears throat> on a daily basis. And they are uh, the fact that we are all subject to illness, to aging, to death, and to the loss of everything we love. And, uh, and the fifth reflection is the good, the moral acts in our life, the, the good and bad acts, are what we inherit. We have to process and deal with these things. Um, that's all we end up with is the moral value of our life. And so you are you are somewhat similar to the story of the Bodhisattva. The, the before he was the Buddha, we call him the Bodhisattva, an enlightenment seeker. And this, there is a story. It doesn't actually occur in the in the life of this Buddha, but it's said to be in the nature of of bodhisattvas. That just around the age of twenty nine, the Buddha is becomes highly aware of mortality, and and all the inevitability of if you don't die young, you'll die old. And 
aging and illness are part of the process. So this is actually a spiritual awakening that you're having is the, the full awareness of mortality. And if you don't have the context that can be uh, make you depressed, uh, it, it can take the meaning out of life, etc. So this is why you uh, should uh, ref do these reflections in the right framework. So how you make sense of this life with its inevitable death is that you determine to uh, do that which is good, you know, the moral actions, positive actions of generosity and kindness and develop your clarity. And that's, a, that's something that is an investment in your well-being and your life, and that's purposeful. At realizing that the material elements of your life are going to just pass away, you're going to lose those things. But if there is a continuation beyond this, then uh, an investment in, in goodness uh, is the best investment. And those kind of mental states of being generous and kind and so forth are, are cheering. So they, they are contrary to depression. So you commit with, without reservation to positive acts of generosity and kindness and social action, but also you work on your own mind because if you just work on social action and don't have a philosophy or a, a view, a context for these things, then you can, people burn out get depressed, even though they're doing good things, you need a philosophy of life. And uh, the basic philosophy of Buddhism is the, how to overcome suffering. So your depression is actually a form of suffering. And so you need a view, uh, a view of, of life which overcomes that, that alleviates that um, feeling. And uh, that is the, the purpose of the teachings of the Buddha, actually. So I just encourage you to, to investigate more about the, the, the core teachings of the Buddha, that is the Four Noble Truths and the Eightfold Path. And if you don't know about them, uh, watch my videos on them. You will see them on the, this channel. Four Noble Truths, and then each of the factors of the Eightfold Path I, I do uh, um, explain in, in various length videos. Uh, some are short, some are medium length, and some are quite extensive, you, you know, yeah, full exploration of certain factors of the path. So that will get you off to a good start, yes. Okay, let's go on to the next question. Our next question is from the live chat from Hermit Mouse in the Southwest. Can you please explain a bit about what a lay hermit is and how to get the most out of this lifestyle. The, the figure of the lay hermit occurs, you find this in the suttas, uh, people practicing on their own, almost, in a, almost like a monk. They live alone and they are devoted to, to spiritual practices, but they are not ordained. And this kind of character comes up on a, on a fairly regular basis in the suttas. And uh, what is required to do that, by the way, I was a lay hermit for a period of years as well. Before I became a monk, I was, uh, I lived in a remote shack in the mountains of British Columbia and practiced uh, exclusively practiced uh, meditation and uh, investigating the, the Dhamma, the Buddha Dhamma. What you need before you go there, and it was, I, I, I was inclined to go out into, you know, wilderness areas and spend time. But the, the, the problem is how to, how to sustain that life uh, without just passing the time by reading novels or something like this. So, you know, the only way to live the hermit life, the a contemplative hermit life, is you have to have a well-developed uh, meditation practice. There is no way, other way to live alone. And this is the case for monks as well. 
you'll see several a number of stories of young monks who wanted to go off and be live a you know the more solitary life, and uh, the Buddha says, "Well, you're probably not ready, but they want to go anyway." So he says, "Okay, we'll go off there." And then they 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 come back in a fairly short period of time, realizing that they they just don't know how to fill the time. They they end up just dwelling in their memories, old hurts and old desires and fantasies, and they, they become anxious. They they dream a lot. They they don't know what to do with themselves. So this is there's no much point in being a, a hermit, either a monastic or a lay hermit, if you haven't developed your meditation practice so that you actually can pass the days in a profitable way. And so it's a very difficult number to do, this lay hermit life. One should get training in a community first, uh, spend t extensive periods of time in monasteries and and then when you have a practice and you can actually ent get some what is called samadhi or a sort of a blissful concentration, a blissful uh, uh, experience of the mind, sustained uh, serene concentration, it, it, it's that that you, that you live on. Uh, you can enter into deep experiences of loving kindness, uh, you can of cessation of the of of thinking and pondering, uh, accompanied by joy and ease. These are the what sustain you in that that lifestyle. And if you can't do those, you will you will quickly be running for town, or you will be distracting yourself, or you'll get a little bit crazy. And so that's what the the Buddha. A man comes to the Buddha one time and he says, you know, these monks living under trees all by themselves all day with no distractions. You know, if they didn't have some sort of concentration or samadhi, they'd go crazy. And he said, just, just so, just so. Somebody who lives in solitude and doesn't have the concentration can go crazy. <laughs> so you need to develop that. One of the most famous sort of solitary recluses in American history is, is Thoreau, Henry Thoreau, and uh, you can read Walden and some of his other writings. He, he lived, he, he didn't spend all that much time as a hermit, and he, he was, uh, had other things to do during that period of time. He was two years and two months in his, in his cabin on Walden Pond. But he had other things that he was busy with. He was um, had a large garden, uh, raising beans and stuff, and he was a uh, surveyor as well, and occasionally would have visitors. Uh, so it, it's in order to live without kind of uh, distractions and so forth. It's quite a. It's quite a. You need a lot of training. And you need the, the talent and ability to do this. Otherwise, you should just stay with a community and develop and cultivate within that community. Okay, let's go on. Yeah. Next question is from Abdul in Las Vegas, Nevada, United States. Dear Ajahn, I want to start a Buddhist society at my university since there is not one already. What should I be wary of in undertaking this task? How should it be structured? What kind of guidance should I seek and what teachers should I find? Well, we have, I have uh, a lot of experience over the last, you know, I've been a monk for 35 years, but even before that I've been in monastic communities. And so one of the lessons I've learned is that you need to get clear about what type of Buddhism are you practicing? And is this a, a Buddhist group, uh, a specific, say, a Theravada Buddhist group, or is it philosophies of the world 101, or is it religions of the world, or opinions of the world? So uh, none of those work. Um, fruit salad stuff is for university courses. You, you do surveys of religions of the world or something, that's a course, but this is 
in order to establish a profitable, a profitable in, in a sense of like helpful to people uh, group, you need to decide what exactly the theme of your teaching is and you stay with that. Okay. So I have a, what's called an Upasaka program. Now, Upasaka is a lay person who is, is quite committed and interested in the Dhamma and associates with the, the, the monastics. So one who comes close to the, to the monks or the, or the nuns. And I have started a online Upasaka program. And we have many hundreds now of people who have taken that course. And then if, if they sit, join together in a room, uh, participate in meditations and so forth, and listen to talks together, they're on the same page. And they don't get into these, you know, opinions and conflicts and, you know, wasting each other's time with various uninformed opinions. So this is the, the thing is that you need a very clear uh, commitment to a certain type of teaching and um, avoid the, the, the sort of generalist kind of idea. That can, it, you don't restrict people's uh, interests. They can be exploring Sufi dancing and uh, various other things on the side, but not in that group, not at that particular time. So that's the, the key to it. So I've pondered this for many, many years, and this is the training structures that we have. Now, if you want books uh, about uh, uh, books to recommend for people uh, in the group and online Upasaka training, then come to our website. Our website has recommended books by mainstream, well-informed, uh, uh, reputable monastics. And uh, we have a nice uh, selection of them that will give you basic information. And then, of course, this YouTube channel I have almost 300 uh, videos on it, which can be used uh, as teachings. And I have some books as well. And uh, in fact, I'm going to introduce a book, right? I just, just uh, finished writing and publishing a book. And here it is. It is called, What Comes Before Mindfulness? And you can find it on Amazon Books. There are three books by me. On Amazon Books, and this is the latest one. It was just released uh, about a week ago, and it's uh, it's primarily about right effort, which is the sixth factor of the Eightfold Path. Uh, why it's called "What Comes Before Mindfulness" is because so many books on mindfulness, but. Mindfulness isolated from the other factors of the Eightfold Path is, is not directed well. And the one that gives you direction about what mindfulness should be uh, informed by is the, the sixth factor, which is called right effort. And, and this, this is neglected. So this, this book is one of the books that I would suggest that for a Theravada group, a uh, Buddhist group, uh, so that's uh, basic information about how to do this. Check our website, the recommended references, uh, inquire into our Apasaka training group, look at the videos on this YouTube channel. They're all mainstream uh, Theravada, but uh, direct to the, uh, uh, a modern uh, audience, a uh, um, a well, an educated uh, and an enthusiastic, <clears throat> committed type of audience to uh, this particular form of Buddhism. So that's some advice for now. Yeah. Next question is from Tyler in Chicago, Illinois, United States. Dear Ajahn, what advice would you give someone with a daily meditation practice who makes an honest effort to follow the teachings of the Buddha, but struggles with a sense of purposelessness? Put otherwise, 
What counts as a well-lived lay life? Yeah, this is, of course, a very, this is one of the great questions, like, what's the meaning of life? <laughs> what's my purpose? And I'm glad that you have a meditation practice. One of the types of meditation that is best for relieving the, this pondering on meaning. Uh, by the way, the question, what is the meaning of life, is sort of, it's not really, there isn't a secret answer to this. What happens is that the question tends to go away. And that's, that's when, you're, when you have purpose and meaning in your life, the question, what is the meaning of this life, what's the point, goes away. It doesn't get answered, it goes away. And that's the, that means that uh, you have a provisionally good uh, result. It's in the dissolving of the question that the answer arises. So uh, now the type of meditation that helps this is pure samadhi type of meditation. Rather than, uh, I mean, I don't know what kind of meditation you're doing on a daily basis. There's people, all kinds of people doing various things, but primarily uh, breath meditation uh, is for the purpose of reducing excessive uh, discursive activity, uh, excessive thinking, because we spend so much time. We're a very highly educated culture, like never on earth before. People are just taken at, at the four and five years old and put into a educational system that forces them to think about things and have critical thoughts and, and overwhelming amounts of information and uh, goes on for decades. And then uh, you're, you're never showing the off switch for this. So you can't really get uh, sort of heartfelt quality emotions through the mere activity of thinking. And so breath meditation is designed by the Buddha for this purpose of over, uh, overcoming excessive discursive activity, excessive thinking. And then the, the question like, what, what am I supposed to be doing, et cetera, usually dissolves. And if you can manage this, it's quite a demand on your attention. So breath meditation done in the right way. And by the way, I have, just look on this channel and you'll find instructions on breath meditation. And it will relieve like anxiety, negative emotional things, impossible to answer questions like, what is my purpose? And it will restore your sense of uh, well-being uh, in, in life. And then out of that, you will more naturally do positive things. You will, you will say things things that are positive, you will have a good, a positive attitude to life. The other one to cultivate is, is just goodwill, like what we call friendliness, you know, uh, understanding and friendliness for, for all of the people around you. Usually the, the, the amount of information that is trafficked uh, in the internet and so forth, there's a huge amount of uh, attention grabbing by, by, by conflict right? And negative. There's a big ar a debate and an argument and so on. So slaughtered somebody in an argument and this, he won this argument and, you know, on and on. It's, uh, it creates this incredible amount of negativity and critical attitudes. So we want to do the opposite is like, uh, focus on more of the compassion and this, and the letting go of the judgments about oneself and others in their own self-assessment. They have negative self-view and this needs to be a let go of. And then the, the, the feeling of a, of a life well lived will emerge out of this, the, the right attitudes, that you don't overthink things and that you have a good uh, friendly heart and that you are kindly to yourself and, uh, and and uh, to other beings as well. And that is how you, how you do this. Yeah. Okay, next question, Pia. Mm -hmm. Next question is from Upasaka Mustafa from Iran. I wanted to discuss a memorable breath meditation experience I had in the past. 
While focusing on my breath, after some time I realized my attention had not wandered for several minutes, and the sensations of my breathing had become very still and uniform in quality. In that moment, I felt confident in my concentration ability. However, as that positive emotion arose, it ended up disturbing my focus, and I began noticing subtle movements in my breath again. Though concentration faded, the feeling of self-assurance remained with me afterwards for a while. May you offer some insight? Yeah, this is uh, this quite often happens is that the first time you really succeed, or even the second or third or the tenth time, uh, the very realization that you're succeeding uh, uh, overturns the experience. Uh, the, the solution to this is to just do it more often. Um, it's kind of like uh, any like a s learning to water ski or um, play music in front of people or sing or things like this. Like at first you're 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 nervous and uh, you're inexperienced, and then event once in a while you can manage to pull it off. But the very pulling it, uh, succeeding at it, it overwhelms the experience, and then you lose it. It distracts you. But how you how do you get over that? You just do it a lot, yeah, until you're not overly uh, distracted or overly concerned at, at your success and also at your failure. Because one who practices this a lot, sometimes your concentration is just not good. Sometimes it is, but you you learn by experiences that eventually, if you do this enough, you'll get back to the to succeeding with it. And there are causes why you succeed. And those are preliminary causes that should be put in, in order to uh, succeed at breath meditation. And you'll find out that if you are associating with uh, distracting and problematic people too much, or uh, distracting yourself with too many sights and sounds and smells and tastes and touches and ideas and so forth, you're it will take its toll on your ability to calm the mind and, and get clarity on the, on the breath. And so you'll find out, okay, well, I have to alter my lifestyle a little bit uh, or even a great, great deal in order to get back to this ability to uh, find uh, concentration. So this is the Buddha is, is a good psychologist in saying, these are the optimal conditions for concentration. It's kind of like advice about how to sleep. So people have trouble sleeping. So the first advice is, you know, get get a bit of fresh air. Make sure that the air in the room is fresh. Uh, are your are your sheets uh, suitable? Are are you going to bed at the right time? Did you watch TV right up to the fall asleep watching a horror movie? Uh, things like this. Uh, do you are you aware that you shouldn't be trying to solve anxious problems at two o'clock in the morning, that it's better to do that in the day when you're awake, uh, things like that. So there are causes that support good sleep and there are causes that support good concentration as well. So that's how you, you improve that. Let's go on to the next question, Pia. Next question is from the live stream, also from Iran, this time from No One Everyone. Dear Ajahn Sona, should the suttas be regarded as the utmost, tru utmost truth and authentic words of the Buddha himself, or rather they have to be analyzed for the core meaning and wisdom to be approached with equanimity, logic, and allegorical understanding, regardless of who the messenger is? Because they were indeed written quite a few years ago after the Buddha's departure and were passed from person to person in those years, and some alterations happening to them would not be so unlikely. Yeah, uh, you need to come at this as a as an adult in this world, and you know that you look around and there's all kinds of uh, philosophies, religions, teachings out there. Some of them are uh, purely nonsense. Some of them have some good words, some good wisdom that you can recognize. Uh, so 
when you come to the teachings of the Buddha, in the, especially in the Pali Canon, uh, these are the collected works that we have. And uh, there are some good, of course, uh, especially in the West, uh, if you come to this with education and, and critical thinking, you wonder, well, are these really the teachings of the Buddha? Who, who, where did they come from? When you investigate them, they're, they do have fairly reliable historical um, uh, reliability. Um, there is a book called The Authenticity of the Early Buddhist Texts by uh, Venerable Sujato and uh, Venerable Brahma, Brahmali, which go into the history and uh, explain uh, how, how they develop and their consistency. There are a few suttas in there that are obviously not by the Buddha. They're actually by disciples, and they're they're later than the, they're after the time of the the Buddha's death, and and you can spot them. Uh, so, and then uh, they should not be taken as they're not literalisms. Uh, this is you see this in Christianity, where you have a people who approach the Bible as uh, every word is the word of God. It's lit it was supposed to be understood literally. And then other people, which I regard as more mature, who uh, appreciate the, the words, but uh, have to ex extract meaning and understand that some things are parables, metaphors, similes, they not to be taken literally. And so this is, to some degree, this is the nature of studying the suttas as well. Uh, you need, this is, you know, it's such a massive collection and it's so full of very, very interesting insights into human nature and uh, understanding of reality. Um, so, yeah, the, it needs to, you need to come at it with, um, not it's not li not literally believing every uh, word of it. It needs you need to extract the meaning out of it and uh, distill the meaning from these things. Um, and it, it, this just takes place over a good period of time. But don't neglect uh, the the beauty of of trying some of the techniques: the breath meditations, the loving kindness, the the compassion, the equanimities, uh, things like this, so that you. That you don't delay it by just studying the menu. You, you actually order the food and start eating some, and see if it benefits you. See how the how the food agrees with you. Try some of the suggestions and attitudes that you find in the suttas, and see if the if it works for you. Yeah. Um, I would like to mention now uh, that on Wednesday this week I will appear by invitation on another uh, YouTube channel with uh, two monks, Ajahn Kovilo and Ajahn Nisabo, on the Clear Mountain uh, Monastery site. It's, uh, you look, look on YouTube, Clear Mountain Monastery, Ajahn Nisabo and Ajahn Kovilo, and that will that will be on Wednesday, I think, uh, seven, uh, six o'clock, I think, in the evening Pacific time. Six o'clock. Six o'clock Pacific time. And then a after that is a, a Zoom. You can actually uh, appear on the Zoom, cha uh, Zoom um, channel, whatever that, the Zoom call. And you can ask questions directly. I will be on the Zoom call afterwards. You can ask questions directly of me or of Ajahn Nisabo or Ajahn Kovilo. Uh, so if you, we've done another one previously, just a couple of weeks ago, you probably saw on my channel uh, about early, the earliest Western monks, the earliest Greek monks in, uh, in Buddhism. And that was uh, Jens Kovilo and Nisabo uh, interviewing me about that. So that's uh, just a little uh, uh, opportunity to see uh, a different format and, uh, and another couple monks and, and, and uh, more 
the more the merrier, I suppose. Uh, as, as well, um, next, uh, not next, next two weeks, the next two weeks, uh, the time for this live stream will be earlier. It'll be 9, 9 a.m. Pacific time. And that's on the 24th of December and the 31st of December, uh, 9 a.m. Instead of 4 p.m. in the afternoon Pacific time, 9 a.m. And that that's so that people who are doing the oh, Christmas holiday thing and uh, what do they call them? The, not the, what's the politically correct thing? The, the, the something holidays, the Christmas, I mean, it's Christmas holidays of some places, but it's Hanukkah and it's the, it's the something of the season, whatever, you know, Buddha mass, you know, I, I don't know what you call it, but you're visiting relatives and you're eating all this stuff and so forth. So uh, we thought the timing would be better. Of course, you can just tune in at 4 p.m. Uh, as normal. And of course, it will be there, but you won't be able to ask live questions. So... Stay tuned for that, 9 a.m. the 24th and 9 a.m. the 31st of December, Pacific time. Okay, let's get back to Dhamma here. Our next question is from the live stream from B. Sway. Is it necessary to read the suttas and Dhamma books, etc., to reach enlightenment? I'm wondering about intellectually impaired people who may not have the capacity No, it's not necessary to read uh, all the suttas. Uh, of course, uh, at the time of the Buddha, nobody read a sutta, not even the Buddha. <laughs> there were no, there was no reading and writing at the time in India, and I'm I'm very interested in this f fact that uh, the suttas were not written down for several hundred years after the time of the Buddha, uh, in terms of the Pali Canon. Uh, and so nobody could read read the suttas. Uh, we had to be exposed to them through teaching, direct teaching by somebody who had who could remember them or understood them. And that's still one of the best ways of approaching it. So this very live stream is is uh, approaching it through the the spoken word and uh, also the visuals. So. This is, and sometimes we add uh, graphics and maps and various illustrations uh, in our in our videos, and it's a great way to uh, to learn. You know, a lot of a lot of people who maybe used to read don't read so much anymore because there's so much information a access through uh, the this new thing, the the web, the internet, and YouTube and so forth. Um, and it's, it's not a bad thing, uh, this ability to just listen to a human voice or an explanation and have these illustrations, the video, etc. Uh, so it is not necessary. You can learn a great deal. And that's the way all of the disciples, Pali Canon, because it wasn't complete moods personally, but still taking responsibility for them. I was in a traffic accident and felt sadness that night, realizing it was probably caused by the impact. It felt less personal, and I could let the feelings go. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I think Ajahn Sumedho gives a talk called Don't, Don't Take Yourself Personally. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, the feelings that are rising and passing away are, are impersonal. In fact, there is no person. <laughs> When we examine the idea of our, our self, uh, we, uh, we're, if somebody asks you, how did you, is that, uh, if you're disappointed in your body or you're very proud of your body, uh, if you're asked, well, when did you make your body, you quickly realize you didn't make your body, it just grew. And you don't know how it works or anything. And in fact, it's not your body. It's just a product of nature. It's a, bio it's a biological organism. That just grows by itself, and yeah, it's and you. People keep saying it's you, and you think it's you, but it's on the least bit of reflection. Your whole body is is a 
some sort of very sophisticated process of the laws of biology, and, and that's all. It runs by itself, and, and even the most advanced medicine doesn't really know, only knows half of how the thing works. So uh, we can't take uh, our bodies uh, personally, and uh, then our mind. Now, where did it, it come from? When did you invent your mind? No, you didn't. You don't know. And how, does, how do you dream? Why do you dream? Nobody knows. Why do you, how do you think? How do you predict? How do you remember? Nobody knows. How do you speak even? How do you walk? How do you do these things? <laughs> Nobody knows. <laughs> it's, it's all impersonal processes. There is, such, there is this mind and there is a body. And it, just for convenience sake, we call, it, call you Bob or Mary or whatever. And, um, but don't take that seriously that there is no Bob or Mary. There's just uh, the organic processes of biology and the processes of psychology, uh, the, the workings of the mind. And there, there, there is no, you are not some sort of separate creator of this. This is just something that, that goes by itself. So when you reflect like this, you get some, you get to get out of the, the illusions around the sense of self and ownership, the ownership of this body, that you're, you are this body, etc. You're not this body. There is, there's no you to have a body. There is a body, there is a mind, but there isn't an owner of, the, of, of these things, other than nature itself, you know. So, uh, yes, uh, not taking things personally, just seeing things, this, this is a great relief. Yeah. Next question is from the live stream from Kromi in Munich, Germany. How to keep the precepts when your home is infested with cockroaches and you have an obligation to your landlord? Yeah. It's, a, it's a situation. I've been in, a, in that situation many times. Uh, as monastics, uh, especially living in the forest and so forth, you're just surrounded by, by uh, insects and animals, and you're always negotiating with this. There are various cultures that don't believe in, like a lot of uh, Indian cultures, that is, uh, as in India, not, not North American Indians, but India, are, believe in non-harm and uh, including insects, and uh, Buddhism is, is that way too. And so they have strategies and ways of dealing with these things. Uh, one, uh, for roaches, cockroaches, uh, one way is to you, you just have um, bottles on the counter and you put some oil in the bottle and they, they crawl into the bottle and they can't crawl out. And then you, take, you can take the bottle to garbage dump or something like that and empty it and they ha they can have a feast uh, somewhere else in, and not in your apartment. So there are roach traps which are not lethal. So there are also roach traps which are based on glue and they the, the roach becomes glued to the trap and that but that just it's it's like the difference between a live trap for mice and rats and a a killing trap. So there are live traps for insects. You can live trap insects. We do it at the monastery. We have um, ways of catching them that are not, and including flies, that are not uh, fatal. And uh, you can catch them, spiders, all these things. You can catch them. If you've got to have the right apparatus. You make that ahead of time so you're not just trying to do it with your hand. There are little plastic gadgets that you can catch insects with with that doesn't kill them and then you just put them outside or you put take them somewhere else so uh, you can you can learn these things um, and uh, you don't have to be have insects crawling all over you um, so there are investigate these ways of uh, capturing and uh, catch and release uh, insects they, they don't they don't have an entitlement to your house they they'll have to find another place uh, and you can you can work with this uh, monastics are obliged to do this all the time 
And and you can learn this. Uh, you know, you're, we're raised in cultures that just you just smash, you know, kill a fly, smash a spider, whatever. It's just thought of as normal and, and et cetera. But these, if you look closely at these these insects, it's they're staggeringly complex. There's a, a Zen poem, a Zen master said, do not kill the fly, look, he washes his hands, he washes his feet. If you look closely at the fly, they, they're they concerned to get, they rub their, their front feet together like this, they rub their, any excess food into, and their rear legs as well. They, <clears throat> I noticed that there's a, something in the, the new technology of the world, and this is they're attempting to develop what's called full self-driving, so that your car drives by itself, without you needing to be to even be behind the wheel. You can have a nap in the back. So they've been struggling with this. The best engineers, the best software people have been trying to do this. They haven't arrived there yet. They have some primitive stuff, but I think then. Think about a housefly. Just try to catch a housefly. Not only can they, neg this tiny little creature has enough software and hardware in its little brain to navigate completely, but it can avoid, in three dimensions, it can avoid being captured by an intelligent human being. <laughs> uh, this is very, very impressive. The most powerful computing we have in the world cannot match the spatial capacities and the life-preserving interests of a housefly. <laughs> so it's a sophisticated little being there. And it has no ill intent. It's just trying to make a living. And same with roaches. They're not, they're not really trying to horrify you or get in bed with you. They're just trying to get enough to, to last the next couple of hours. So we appreciate this, that they all, they scurry away. They don't want to die. You can see, how do I know that an insect doesn't want to die? Because they attempt to avoid any kind of injury or, or death. <laughs> They're very interested in not being injured and not dying. So this is how to think about it and to spend some time and, and learn, learn how to do this without killing them. Yeah. Next question is from Michael in Bamberg, Germany. I see no indication whatsoever that the law of karma is true. I am not satisfied with the explanations given in the suttas, and I find the self-assuredness with which this topic is discussed in Buddhist circles to be presumptuous. No one fully understands karma. Allegedly, the Buddha came closest, but not even he fully understood it. In the Kalama Sutta, we are urged not to trust scriptures, but only our own experience. So where does this leave us? Well, it leaves you where everybody is left. Is you're, you've been in a plane crash, and now you've got to figure out whether to stay in the crash or walk out. You know. <laughs> By the way, uh, listen to my talk called uh, uh, Life is the Game That Must Be Played. And so you're in the same position as everybody else. You have to decide amongst philosophies and attitudes. And there are, there are certain uh, philosophies of life which deny the existence of any sort of moral law at all. There is, there is no real good or evil. It's all fiction. And, and when you die, that's it. The light goes out. And so uh, that's one attitude. Be my guest. Take it up. <laughs> See how it works for you. <laughs> or you think, well, I don't know. Seems that it just like, you know, torturing children or killing, you know, killing people randomly and everything just seems like a bad idea. It can't be all, all this. There must be some <laughs> moral dimension to existence. <laughs> so in the, uh, the, Abrahamic religions, uh, they have this God who decides what's right and wrong, and he's administering these rules for you. 
In Buddhism, we don't have, uh, we don't propose that there's a God keeping track of these things. Uh, but uh, certainly from the physicist's point of view, every tiniest little movement and detail of the, the universe is lawful and is, uh, is working under some sort of order and law. And it doesn't require a administrator. It doesn't require God. From a scientist's point of view, there, everything, including biology, chemistry, biology, and psychology, uh, is all lawful, uh, w is happening for a reason. The, the law which is missing from, say, uh, more or less some modern philosophy since about the 19th century in the West is the law of morality. Is there such a thing as moral philosophy? Now, if you get your hardcore logical positivists, I used to love to read Bertrand Russell, very logical positivistic. And he said, moral philosophy, there is no moral philosophy. You know, there's, there's logical philosophy. There's all kinds of, there is no moral philosophy, uh, et cetera. So if you're inclined that way, um, just try it. Uh, Buddhism asserts, the Buddha asserts that there is a law, and this is called karma. And he also tells you that it is, uh, on an ultimate basis, it's incalculable. You can't know all of, the, uh, all of it. By the way, this is the same with physics. Uh, I don't know whether you've... Uh, uh, there, a physicist said, if you, if you could compute all of the... Uh, known particles in the universe and get their trajectories and everything, you could then predict the future 100% because everything is absolutely rigidly determined, but it's beyond all capacity to do such a thing. So we can't, we can't even predict the, you know, what's going to happen in five minutes because the infinite uh, number of variables is uh, intrinsically incalculable. So there's nothing new about this. You're, you're saying that uh, we, we can't calculate, even the Buddha couldn't calculate this. Well, guess what? We have all these laws of physics and it's not, it's beyond calculation because there's just too many possibilities. Do you not believe there are laws in physics? Therefore, because even Einstein couldn't figure it all out. <laughs> you, we operate within a sense of like uh, judgment. And so you just try setting aside all sense of uh, moral dimension of life. Just try it sometime. Even the, these people who claim that they are without um, moral beliefs, that they're, they're all arbitrary opinions, usually do not live that way. They're not, they're, they appear not to be convinced of that. Although they will say it, they don't act like they do. Occasionally you do get a real ripe psychopath that does seem to act as if there are no more moral cause, but it, it tends to be rare. <clears throat> um, and they don't live a satisfactory life either. So whether you like it or not, you, you end up being forced towards a moral commitment without full knowledge. And uh, if you want to wait for full knowledge, help yourself. We, we, Buddhism is not trying to convince you of anything because we realize we can't. Uh, the Buddha himself is not proselytizing or trying to... Uh, he, he will, he's willing to answer questions, but he says, look, this is, this is hard even if you really want to do it, if you're really searching yourself, let alone if you're resistant. I don't have time to talk to people who are resist tonight. It's your life. Take it or leave it, whatever. But if you're really interested and really trying, I, I'm happy to give you a few tips. That's all. So Buddhism is quite indifferent to your thinking, uh, nobody knows this and nobody knows that. Fine. That's the way a lot of people are in the world. But if you're really interested and you really uh, are exploring it, we can give you a few tips along the way. That's all we can do for you. But uh, it's not a. It's quite fine for you to ask those questions and and to have doubts. But at the same time, 
you're not off the hook, my friend. You, you must find your way through this life and not everything will be presented in a nice, orderly, scientific way. Even science, <laughs> science itself and philosophy are incomplete, <laughs> intrinsically incomplete. Yeah. Okay, let's go on to the last question. Okay. Final question today, Ajahn, is from our live stream from Adichita. Dear Ajahn, can you please give advice on protection against mental, mental proliferation about the self? What was I in the past? How was I? Where am I going? Etc. Like in MN2. Yeah, the, the concerns about the self. First of all, we have to uh, realize that the Buddha is addressing a society around him that had theories about a self. Uh, his contemporaries, the Jains, for instance, uh, had a very strong theory about the self, and the Brahmins had a theory about the self. And all of them, and, and actually, uh, if you look at Christian philosophers, they have a theory about the self, like the, the soul, in other words. And the theory was that there is this uh, indestructible, unchanging, sort of solid spatial entity that is not your body or your mind and that this is your real self and your soul and uh, the Buddha realizes that, that, that that's naive thinking I mean it's it's a way of of imagining how how something would pass beyond death you know so uh, some uh, an immortal soul how, do, how does anything survive death? If there is survival of death, then there must be something that doesn't die and is not affected by these things. So that all these theories developed about this, this uh, immortal substance. And uh, the, the, what the Buddha is saying is there isn't one. Uh, <clears throat> what you... All that you are is what you can experience uh, in your the body mind and and the various aspects of your psychology and so forth are are what really is and these are all transient and uh, this is <clears throat> this is uh, how not to think of a self etc now as far as the processes of this body mind we don't want to uh, personalize it too much we just say well what I identified with as me, like when you're a child, you, I'm getting bigger. Mom, look at how big I am now. I'm tall. I grew up, or you're you're not growing up. You're you're the shortest one in the family, you know on this. I'm smart. I'm I'm talented. I'm I'm beautiful. I'm this. I'm that. These are ideas that are don't accord with reality. There isn't an owner of these things. There is a there is a biological body. It's genetics. It's it's biological laws, and then there are traits and mental capacities. Some of them are in just inheritances. Some of them are uh, from the environment, etc. And this is the way to think about it in a more or less less personalized way, and just noting these phenomena so that we don't have the so uh, we, that we don't detect the emotional attachment, problematic emotions that arise around reflecting on who am I, what was I, etc. <clears throat> but it doesn't mean that we can't remember anything or that we don't plan the future or even aspire to things. This is the case that we do aspire to things and this is important that we put in the right causes for this, that we that we can actually put in causes that will have good results and that we also mistakes or unfortunate things we've done in the past should be not uh, we should not be preoccupied with we should make uh, 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 an aspiration to make less mistakes and make more positive uh, types of thoughts and speech and actions and so this is how what is meant here. So 
uh, that that uh, type of saying that you find in the suttas is obscure and is like, what is what do you mean here? But if we have a general idea of the of what the Buddha is teaching, we see first thing is people get lost in theories about a self. Set them aside. Stay with what you can see, your body and your mind and your feelings. Now, what kind of uh, positive restructuring can we do with those things? Yeah. So that is it for today. Welcome back. We were um, away for the last uh, few times, and but we made good use of it. We had some nice... Uh, opportunities uh, in the last uh, three weeks. <clears throat> and we will be back for some live streams for the foreseeable future. And remember that on Wednesday, I will be with Clear Mountain Monastery on YouTube and also on Zoom. <laughs> okay, so long for now.